This week, we welcome Mike Lloyd, former epidemiologist and currently the chief technology officer at Red Seal, to discuss lessons for cybersecurity from a pandemic. In the leadership and communications section, top five tactical steps for a new CISO, good leadership is about communicating why, five, okay, maybe only four CISO priorities during the COVID-19 response, and more. Business Security Weekly starts now. This is Security Weekly, for security professionals, by security professionals. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, it's the show where we explore the business of security to improve the security of business. Your trusted source for actionable insights on leadership, communication, and innovation. Get ready for Business Security Weekly. With over half of enterprise security budgets going towards detection and response in 2020, the challenge is investing in solutions that can migrate and scale with your business. ExtraHop helps security teams spot threats up to 95% faster and respond 60% more efficiently in hybrid and multi-cloud environments with cloud-native network detection and response. Kick the tires in the full product demo at securityweekly.com forward slash ExtraHop. The question is simple. Have any of the systems on my network been compromised? The answer is harder than it should be. Enter AI Hunter. Active Countermeasures has automated and streamlined techniques used by the best pen testers and threat hunters in the industry to create AI Hunter, a network threat hunting solution that does the first pass of a hunt for you to identify systems that are most likely to be compromised and scores the results on a scale from 0 to 100. You can then research those systems in depth with AI Hunter. Focus your valuable time on the systems that need your expertise with AI Hunter. Sign up for a personal demo today at securityweekly.com forward slash ACM. Welcome to Business Security Weekly. This is episode number 173, recorded May 11th, 2020. I am your host, Matt Alderman, here in Colorado. Joining me from G Unit Studios in Rhode Island is my co host, Mr. Paul Asadorian. Hey, thanks, Matt. Sorry, quick wardrobe adjustment. I realized I blended in with the background. <laughs> <laughs> I noticed my, that. <laughs> I had to go get my jacket. <laughs> Thank you, Andrea, for pointing that out. I'm like, oh, wait, I can fix that. <laughs> it's like wearing a green shirt on a green screen. You're in trouble. Yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> and on the lines, joining us remotely is my second co-host, Mr. Jason Albuquerque, hopefully not blending in with the background. I am it's not. I'm black on white right now, it. so I'm good to go. Yeah, see, I can never wear a gray shirt on the show because of the gray wall behind me. I blend in, so I've, I've learned to make sure I add color, uh, not just gray. Oh, gosh. Join us at InfoSec World 2020, June 22nd to 24th, now a fully virtual event. Security Weekly listeners say 15% off the InfoSec World main conference or World Pass. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash ISW 2020. Click the register button to register with our discount code. Also join the Security Weekly mailing list by visiting securityweekly.com forward slash subscribe and clicking the button to join the list. We have already started rolling out our public Discord channel. And so if you wanna get an invite on that list, subscribe to the listener list, you'll get the first set of invites. All right, on to our guest. Dr. Mike Lloyd has more than 25 years of experience in the modeling of and control of fast-moving complex systems. He has been granted 21 patents on security, network assessment, and dynamic network control. Before joining Red Seal, Mike Lloyd was Chief Technology Officer at Route Science Technologies, acquired by Avaya, where he pioneered self-optimizing networks. Mike holds a degree in mathematics from Trinity College in Dublin, Ireland, and a PhD in stochastic epidemic modeling from Harriet Watt University in Edinburgh. Scotland. Mike, welcome back to Business Security Weekly. A pleasure to be back with you. We had to get the epidemiology part out. You do have a PhD in uh, modeling uh, on the epidemiology side. See, and we I, want... Matt, now, Matt, I thought everyone on Facebook had that same degree, the mm-hmm. way that they post. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't used to claim that, you know, right? The, the, this is one of the things about the, the interest. So they, thank you for that. But these days, I don't have to explain what it means that I have an epidemic degree right. because people are actually spending a bit more attention on these things. <laughs> <laughs> exactly right. But that's why we thought it would be appropriate to make sure people understood th- this is the type of modeling that, that your PhD is in. And what we want to do today is actually correlate aspects of 
epidemiology in, in a pandemic like we're in right now with cybersecurity. And we thought this would be an interesting uh, discussion for our audience to kind of look at the corollaries. So where Absolutely. do you want to start, Mike? Yeah. Well, you know, uh, for, for me, it, it's uh, a journey I've been on for a very long time, right? I, I, I was indeed studying uh, epidemic spread. I was studying diseases, uh, nearest neighbor infection processes. Uh, this is uh, probably about 40 years ago. Um, and I still do the same stuff, but about every 10 years, I change the name uh, that we apply to it. So uh, at one point, I called it uh, uh, network management and help people sort of build up networks that had more connectivity because networks really are a lot like diseases. If you think about what a router does, Right, a router on a backbone, it learns about some of its neighbors, and then it tells its neighbors, and they tell their neighbors, and they tell their neighbors, and this is a nearest neighbor epidemic process. So that, that's how I connected uh, epidemiology to networking. Uh, that then I turned it into some other things like routing control, and, and now we use it for cybersecurity. But it, it's really always the same process of trying to get machines to think about complex network effects, because, well, frankly, we humans aren't very good at it. And so that, that, that's why it seemed like a, a good theme for, for, uh, for your audience here about, uh, you know, get, get, getting to think about what does this disease teach us about the network security we have to do in our day jobs. You know, it's, it's really uh, it just like brings back very vivid memories of when I worked for a university in the early 2000s and there were network worms running around. Right. And we did two things that are very clear, like, like that you mentioned in your notes and we're all talking about today is when I found machines that were infected I would literally use the term quarantine and I would quarantine them into their right. new own networks, right? Then as we got a little more advanced, as new machines came on the network, we would check them for symptoms of being infected. And if they were, we would quarantine them and deny them access to the network, which in human form is pretty much the same things we're doing pretty much across the globe. Right. Yeah, it, of course, it starts with the worms, and then we had the wave of viruses, which was a mm -hmm. slightly different evolution. And then we had that whole industry that we've talked about here before about antivirus. Right? Right, it's right. not a coincidence this terminology shows up in both places, because there are some interesting similarities. Right? The, the things over which these cyber diseases are spreading aren't really the same as humans. There are some important differences, like most computers don't have an immune system to speak of the way that right. humans do, which is really very, very important. Mm -hmm. But the disease propagation out across the network is very, very similar, right? It, it, the, the, why are we all in lockdown? Why are we all at home? Well, because we're trying to break up the network that the disease is trying to use to, to spread itself. And that, that's exactly the technique that you used back when you had to shut down worms that were propagating. You had to quarantine. You had to break the, the propagation. And so even though the individual nodes are different, when we think about computers or we think about people, the lateral movement effect the way that things spread across a network. That's really the common mathematical piece that I think is interesting here. Mm. So Mike, as we think about um, lateral movement for a second in the spread, one of the first guidelines that came out is this concept of social distancing. Right. How does that equate in a network? How do you social distance in a network environment? Mm. Right. And of course, we're all trying to adapt our ways of working so that we use video so, so much more now and we're doing so much telecommuting. And we've been able to figure out how to separate the, uh, the biology, <laughs> separate the people far, further away from each other and still do good online work. So, so human, humans are very ad adaptable that way. But our networks, it's a lot more difficult, right? I mean, of course, we've been through this revolution of the power of the internet uh, you know, as it arose over the last 30, 40 years. And it's changed so much about the way the world is, but it depends on things communicating with each other. And so the diseases have adapted so that they use those same pathways. And you can't simply say, okay, well, the way we solve the disease propagation on the internet is we shut down the internet. That's not going to work. So you have to figure out other ways to get the equivalence of social distancing for your network. And of course, one, one very simple catchword for this is segmentation. Once upon a time, of course, pe people tried to do uh, medieval wall building, right? We, 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 in this industry, had that phase where people really tried to just put a really good firewall at the edge of, of, of the network. So the equivalent of a medieval city building a city wall and trying to keep the bad guys out that way. And that worked for a while until the bad guys invented cannons. And then all of a sudden those walls didn't work so well anymore. Mm. And so you have that arms race that we've had in human history, and we're watching the same thing play out 
slowly, but faster than it did for humans over decades of evolution of the internet. As, as we see the weapons get better, when the diseases get better, we have to get better and better now at things like micro segmentation, not just a big wall around your corporation, but now thinking about internal borders. Why? Because of lateral movement, because the diseases spread laterally. Right. So micro segmentation, one, one good corollary. What about... Uh, we we also talk about contact tracing um, right. as well now, right? The contact tracing is this really hot topic in the industry. What is our equivalent on the cybersecurity side for contact tracing? Yeah, and and of course we you know we're, we're all now used to this idea, and we're watching uh, countries, organizations struggle with contact tracing. Right? How how fast can we train people? Because we were clearly caught on the back foot, right? We clearly weren't ready globally. I'm not I'm not picking any one particular country. No countries were really ready to do contract, contact tracing on a wide scale. Some have been more successful than others for reasons that are detailed about politics or about culture. But in general, across the world, we've really struggled with uh, how, how can we tell when we've got one infected person where it's spread to. And of course, in security, we have some of the same things. We, we've gotten very, very good at building sensors, very, very good at getting alarms. Okay, we get all these alarms, but then what? Suppose your sensors get really, really good and they can now tell you your APT is over on this machine over here. Well, by the time you've processed that, that signal, you know they're not there anymore. That means they'll have moved laterally back to point number one. Okay, but that means you have to have a way to keep up and try and uh, build a fire break, or try and contain, or try and to at least sense that lateral movement. Now, if you do that the way people are at the moment, as we try to think about contact tracing, you'll never be ready. Right? Clearly, we'd be better off today if we were more prepared as people to do contact tracing to combat the coronavirus. But in, in cybersecurity, we have to be ready in advance. If we go into a mad panic during an incident about, oh, goodness, now I need to know how things move laterally around my ne network, it's already too late. And the, the good news, of course, for cybersecurity professionals is managements and boards and people who hand out money are relatively aware of this. You know, it's really brought home to a lot of people who don't normally think about cybersecurity that preparation kind of matters and you can tell the difference between the people who are well prepared for this disease and the people who are not so well prepared. So if you want to do contact tracing, if you want to track lateral movement as it happens, as it is going on in your network, you better have planned ahead. What does that mean? Does that mean drawing up some documents and uh, dusty things that you put on a shelf? No, not really. Uh, what, what I find for healthy organizations is the, one, the ones who are prepared have a living, dynamic map of their organization. That, that's a technical map of the assets that make, make up the organization, not, not just a list, but actually an organized map, but also some picture of how business flows work across that. We, we talk about PCI plenty here, and I know you, you guys have lots of good stories around PCI compliance, but what, what does PCI demand of you? If you have somebody's credit cards inside your network, you'd better know the pattern of the business flows that get those credit card numbers in and out. If you don't even know that, you won't be able to respond. So the trick with contact tracing is to say, we need to be prepared, we need a map of our assets, and we need to know how they interact normally so that we can go track when the inevitable happens. Yeah, and right. Mike, one of the one of the things that you know my my team and I did as well, which I think we can kind of relate to to the coronavirus is is we know coronavirus can can go undetected on surfaces, right? Right. So doorknobs, grocery carts, uh, you know, uh, people's computers. If you're working on the computers, it, it can go. You know, it, it can literally take a foothold. And, and one of the things we did when we when my organization moved to a hundred percent remote workforce is we started identifying risks where. Um, you know, a potential threat actor could take a foothold within people's home environments, IoT, right. all of the technologies they have within their homes, right? So it literally expanded that footprint and that threat landscape wider. And we tried our best to figure out how we can mitigate that risk by going 100% remote workforce. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, and and th that stealth component of, of any virus, including this one, where it hides on surfaces that you're talking about, uh, that, 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 that's another really important area to think about. Because of course, we, we put so much energy in our industry into sensing. We build mountains and mountains of data, and then we don't really manage to analyze it all, right? Because we're, we're, we're hoping that we can catch every signal. And it's not gonna happen, right? It doesn't happen with the, with the real disease we're fighting at the moment, and it doesn't happen online either. There'll always be dark spaces. There'll always be things you can't see. There'll always be signals that, that you miss. But that doesn't mean we give up, right? We don't have the luxury of giving up and going home, right? And so, 
what, what can you do? Well, another one of those coronavirus lessons is slow it down. Right? We know that's what flatten the curve is about. Right? The, the fewer people die if you can flatten out the curve. Even if the same number of people get infected, the total death rate goes down if you can slow the thing down. Well, the same is true in a network where there can be just like that infected uh, counter countertop or doorknob. Right? There's an undetected infection inside your network. Well, okay, but it helps if you can slow it down because the adversaries, while they're very clever, they're also trying to stay out of sight. And for them to stay out of sight, they have to move very carefully and slowly, and that's why they're advanced and persistent. Right? But, but as they do that, you can benefit a lot if you slow them down by having good segmentation, by having good mapping of your environment and knowing what the boundaries are so that you can have tripwires in effect. So, so that you know, if you know this zone over here, this data center, really, you know, it really should not be communicating with just random desks over there, and then you notice something doing that, you, you've got a far better chance of catching that anomaly, even though you might not have seen the moment of infection that happened in somebody's home because of all the remote workers you talked about. So, of course, you know, it, it happens when we, uh, if, you, if you look at the way sa a safe is sold, right? They don't sell safes by how perfect they are and how they'll stop every attack known to man. No, no safe is ever bought for perfect protection. Safes are sold and rated by how many minutes will they slow down a determined adversary. And the more you spend, the more minutes of slowing down you get. And you're supposed to buy an appropriate kind of safe for somebody uh, uh, you know, in, in, in your situation because of how quickly you think you can respond. So you need to be able to balance your speed of response in a world where you won't have perfect knowledge, but where you can build an environment and, and plan out an environment and, and have knowledge ahead so that you can slow down the spread when it comes. So an, another similarity with the virus at the moment. Yeah, and I, I think to some it may, it may seem overwhelming to do that, but um, you know, if we take some lessons learned from this, it's prioritize those assets or classify them, right? Mm -hmm. Look at the most high risk and prioritize the protection of them. I mean, coronavirus came out and said, if you have pre-existing conditions, if you're elderly, you know, and started educating the populace as to where the highest risk uh, it was for exposure and started protecting it that way. So I, I think yeah, that's a I mean, my, my dad lives in England. Uh, he has a history of lung problems, right? I, he's crown jewels to me, right? He's really, really precious to me. And he, he is under strict orders in the UK because of the way, the way they do it. So, so he, he, he is protected. And so, yes, prioritization is always the name of the game, especially because, again, we, we, we drown in data. We, we, you know, um, we've talked a little bit about the OODA loop, uh, you know, the, this military dis, uh, idea of observe, orient, decide, act. Well, we're so good at observe in the security business. We're not so good at orient and decide. Right, we 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 soak up so much data, and and so we always have to prioritize, and that means you need again to have prepared, you need to have mapped out in advance who your precious, uh, you know, uh, elderly people are who are going to need protection, right? Because you know, so some bits because you got very very valuable secrets, but an awful lot of organizations, again, remind uh, connecting to the virus today, are realizing well they have assets that are fragile. Um, if, if you're in the online, uh, if, you know, if you're purely an online company, maybe this isn't so clear, but a lot of companies who are struggling to deal with all, all the, the lockdown are the ones who hadn't quite figured out how to virtualize their business because let's say they do meat processing or sports events or, uh, you know, air traffic control. A lot of these things depend on specialized equipment that isn't just carried around on, on a laptop. So, so when you've got those kinds of assets, if you're in manufacturing, say, or, or, or you're in healthcare itself, You've got an awful lot of these internet endpoints, right? An IoT conversation. You've got these endpoints that they're just fragile, the same way my father is. And so you have to do some, some special things to protect them, to, to, to build segmentation. So you have to plan that in in advance to slow down the spread so you can intervene. Now, we also learned some basic hygiene rules, I think, as part of uh, the right. pandemic which we can also apply to cybersecurity as well. The basic wash your hands after you go to a store, you know, we have corollaries on the cybersecurity side as well. Absolutely. In, in fact, perhaps my favorite lesson out of uh, thinking about coronavirus in the context of cybersecurity and uh, uh, computer security is basic hygiene really really matters, right? I think a lot of people in the early days of the virus were thinking, oh, well, some genius in a white coat is going to come save us all because there'll be a, a vaccine. Well, there still isn't one. And if you talk to the real professionals, they're still saying, we're trying, but we really have no idea how long it's going to take us to get a vaccine made for this thing. And so people were expecting this magic pill with a complicated name. And that's not it. The real advice is wash your hands. 
And wash your hands is extremely effective. Soap is a really effective way of killing this particular nasty little bug. And the same is true in our networks, right? We, 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 when we go to the security conferences and, and we go look at the latest and greatest technology, right? We're humans and humans are very novelty focused. We like shiny new things. And so we get very excited about the latest wrinkle in AI or the latest uh, advanced detection mechanism that can do some crazy thing. And this is cool technology. I, I enjoy looking at it too. But that's not really what security is about day to day. Real security is about doing the equivalent of washing your hands. So following best practices, building a basic inventory, making sure that you have a map of what your infrastructure looks like. Right? This is the equivalent of just start with washing your hands. I, I, you know, I've talked to a good number of CISOs now about, you know, l let's say you had three compliance programs that you picked to be priorities. We talked about prioritization. And suppose you were 90% compliant with, with those goals. Is that time to move on? And everybody agrees. No, 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 no. You don't move on and add a fourth and a fifth and a sixth project when you're at 90% compliance. 90% is nowhere near good enough. Stick to the basics. Get to 99. Get to 99.9. .9. Go chasing that elusive 100% of just the basics. And it's the same lesson with this virus where just washing of hands and wearing a mask is fundamentally effective at stopping it. Yeah, I think the, the virus to me has taught us some basic risk management principles. Right. right. We we identify where our critical or um, in harm's way population is. And, and maybe there we have to do some level of quarantine and isolation. We would do that in our normal networks from a micro segmentation perspective. Uh, then we have to look at, well, what do we do for the rest? We do the basics. Right. We do the hand washing. We, we wash our hands and, and we try to prevent the spread of the disease that way. Uh, very similar it, when you think about how it ultimately kind of plays out is, is there is a, a, a need to quarantine in certain areas, but right. doing the basics also has a big impact as far as spread is concerned as well. Yeah, that, that's right. I think, I think it's optimistic that, that uh, basic hygiene is so effective, right? That, that's an important optimistic message. But of course, we as an industry are also facing the same terrible choice that countries and politicians are facing right now about how do you trade off blocking the virus with economic activity. Mm. So we, we get this idea that hygiene really matters and segmentation really matters, but segmentation fundamentally is about building borders, right? That's what we do in security. We know in some sense we are friction to the business, right? And we have to figure out how we can make that productive and how do we get the right balance so that we're not just so focused on absolute eradication of every bug, right? We, we don't want to be Howard Hughes, right? We don't want to get a mania for hand washing to the point where you start damaging this, the skin cells in your hands, right? You have to get that balance right of, yes, we want basic hygiene, yes, it really does work, but we can't be a barrier to the business, right? There's uh, the old remark from uh, Rhonda McLean about, you know, why do they put brakes on a racing car? So it can go faster. That's really kind of a profound point or d different analogy, but the idea that when, when we are adding friction to the business, we have to still allow it to be adaptable. We can't lock everything down. We have to allow adaptability in the same way that we have to figure out how to have healthy economic activity without ruining the protection of the people we're trying to keep alive in this scary virus time. My God. And I think, I think part of that as well is the education and the mm -hmm. communication, right? I mean, we're all experiencing it now with our federal governments, our state governments, our local governments. You know, they're, they're constantly communicating and educating. That's, right. I think that's part of hygiene as well. And it's not just to the broader community, it's to all the other business units around that, that are involved. So having that level of communication on being able to uh, translate risk, allow the business to accept or mitigate or transfer, or however we want to do that, um, make it a business decision, right? Because that's how you get the broader buy-in. And, and I think you get that better balance. Absolutely. You know, and the, the, I think you're hitting some of the deeper points there about, you know, w w why are we he hearing so many politicians get up and public health uh, representatives get up and, and give these kinds of talks? Well, because it's a time of uncertainty and people really desperately need that communication. So, so uh, you, you, you're also bringing out the way that we need to continuously communicate to improve people's basic hygiene, to remind them to wash their hands because people, in fact, aren't very good at that. Um, but but the, the, the way that that communication can really help when people are facing uncertainty, right? When, when the cyber stuff hits the fan, 
there's a lot of that same kind of uncertainty and shock through the through inside a corporation. And you have to be a very good communicator. You have to be very clear about your security message. You you, you can't just be Dr. No, right? You, you, you have to have ways to communicate, which is why this whole conversation for the last half hour is getting into understanding what messages people have in their heads about the virus and how you can attach to those and say, so we as an organization, we need to wash our hands. We need better hygiene. We need to be prepared for contact tracing. We need to be thinking about lateral movement, but we don't want to shut down the economy. We want to get the balance right between protecting the fragile, the, 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 the elderly, the, the, the infirm, the precious, right? And, and, but still keeping the organization successful and adaptable so it can keep moving. Mike, there's some interesting parallels when we compare a pandemic uh, to a network virus, right, when it comes to testing. And actually, right. when early on, right, some of the ways in which there would be an outbreak, it was pretty easy for me to test and see who was infected, right? I could do a network port scan, and if it responded on that port with a certain banner, I knew it was likely compromised, right? Now, there are also instances on the network side that were very difficult for me to determine who was infected and, and who wasn't. How does testing kind of play uh, in both sides, and what are your thoughts on, on testing? Oh, absolutely. I mean, it, it, again, in the response to this particular virus, it's clear that we weren't ready to test on enough scale, and it's clear that testing is extremely important to figuring out when you can reopen. So, you know, sadly in our world, I, I, as you quite rightly say, we've traditionally been able to pick up cybersecurity signal very quickly, right? You do a port scan, you find a port that's open, and if you can find it, you know somebody malicious has hit that port already. Right. Right? The, the time to infection of a random machine exposed to the internet has been going down and down and down steadily from the minutes now mm -hmm. down into the seconds, right? So if anything gets exposed, it's going to be owned. It's going to mm -hmm. happen. Right? So we, we, we didn't need super sophisticated testing. But the problem is when we do apply even basic port, port scanning like that, we still find stuff. And so I think this gets to the point that our modern cyber infrastructure is complicated, right? And, and so we kind of know a lot about security, just, just like you're saying, right? We, we know how to lock down a port. We know how to install a firewall on one node. We know how to make elements that are secure. We really still don't know how to make systems mm. that are secure, right? If, if, if I could uh, make another analogy to the human immune system, what, one interesting thing about um, animals, uh, humans are a, partic a particularly good example, but it's true of a lot of animals as well, is we achieve this amazing resilience by having not very resilient parts. Now, if you think about what, what, why do we turn over so many cells in the human body, right? You know, these, these com common ideas that, you know, everything in your body has been replaced within the last seven years or so, right? Different parts of the body age out at different times. But we, we throw away an awful lot of our, 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 of, of our body so that we get resilience overall. So, so you can get systemic resilience from individual elements that aren't resilient. Now, that's something biology has figured out. It's been mm. the successful biological uh, approach when dealing with a hostile world, because, of course, other biological systems are trying to attack you. Well, over time, I think the, the cyber world is going to evolve towards that. So it's going to be less to do with the technical knowledge that we have of, okay, how do you poke one port and figure out whether it's open, and more towards building immune systems, bu building in that uh, ability to shed our skin or shed all of the machinery that, that makes up our networks, the, the way that animals do it the way that humans do it. And I, I do think, again, there's some optimism there as we head towards the cloud world, right? There've been all these debates about is cloud more secure, less secure, who's responsible, exactly how does that all work? But one of the important things in uh, the Kubernetes world and, and all the various container efforts and so on is that's beginning to approximate mm. the kind of technology that is the building blocks for biological systems that are resilient, right? Where you've got these disposable parts, where you're starting to build individual elements that are designed to fail so the system as a whole becomes a lot more resilient does that make sense yeah that's really cool yeah. and, and does that concept then get us closer to this concept of a herd immunity because now i can mm. start to build some resilient pieces parts in my infrastructure and so that i can build up some level of immunity to an attack yeah, I'm, I'm going to swap hats from practicality towards futurism for a second. And absolutely, that's the way we need to go. Uh, you know, with a lot of what I'm talking about, I'm trying to keep it to practical advice right here today, right? The, the, the equivalence of uh, washing your hands, right? The basic hygiene of map your network, know your business flows, the kind of stuff that PCI regulations require. Uh, you know, th th that's today. That's a, that's a May 2020 problem. Everybody should be trying to find all their remote workers, find all their access points, find all their cloud resources, map it all out. That's the basics. That's, that's, if you like, the herd, not the herd immunity. 
The trick, of course, with herd immunity is it's an amazing biological achievement, not just that the cells are disposable uh, when you make up the human organism, but that human communities have herd immunity that, that can come about. Because if you can get enough people in there with their white blood cells, with their, their immune systems responding well, you can get to a point where you can kill off diseases by making the system as a whole uh, resilient, by, by, by uh, you know, learning how to respond to a given uh, a kind of infection. We're not there yet, but I do think we're starting to see technology evolve. And I, I use that word advisedly here. Right? We, we, we're really watching the evolution of technology to be the, the ones that survive are the ones that have that disposable individual elements, but delivering a more resilient overall system. I want to be careful that we're not there yet. We do not have a decent immune system for cyber security. But you can, you can perceive glimmers of it. As, as, uh, as I say, th things like Kubernetes, I think, are quite exciting because of the way they're starting to build that same principle. And if we can just pursue that for several more years, I think, it's, it's not immediately around the corner, we could get to a point of, you know, the, the, many, many marketing claims have talked about the self-healing network. Well, nice marketing claim. It's really not practical today to, to think about a, a self-healing network. But we are starting to see that. And of course, that is what will then give us herd immunity. All, all the crowdsourcing of threat intel, for example, is, is another piece of that. That's, that's a human network trying to say, look, we can't stop every attack, but at least if we can report it quickly and then share that information, that again is how biological systems and communities behave. And so that, that, that's all good. There, there are good signs of evolution in action in our environments. But God knows we need it because our environments are very unbiological, extremely fragile, very, very prone to breakage. So we, we, we need some of that. I'm just waiting for the first security vendor to use the term herd immunity in uh, their <laughs> advertising. So just saying. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a scary concept, right? Because, of course, herd immunity means an awful lot of people catch the disease. Right? <laughs> it's not going to be pleasant when, when we get to herd immunity. But, but it's a real thing, and epidemiologists really do study how that works, and it is how we stop some diseases. Yes, definitely. Uh, Paul, Jason, any additional questions for Mike while we have him? No, I mean, the one comment I think I'd, I'd like to make is I think that the situation that we're in, I think, is going to have a long-term positive outcome for, for all of us. I mean, yep. it forced some organizations into uh, looking at what a 100% uh, remote workforce would look like and and really forced them into the game of, of, of pushing it out there and, and trying to secure it. So uh, long term, I just I, I just think this is going to have a positive effect on all of us. I, I, I definitely agree with that. I'm, I'm quite optimistic. Right? I, I see some scary things in the disease as it spreads week to week at the moment. And in cybersecurity, we're not building good enough systems. But I'm, I'm with you that at least these are the things that are driving us towards the right outcomes. I mean, I'll, I'll toss one quick one out. Um, I, I lo love this analysis that I saw at the Smithsonian. They, they have some nice exhibits about human origins and, and, and human origins. And they, they deal with why did humans evolve, right? It's, kind of, it's a good question. It's a funny question. Um, you know, people have looked for that one evolutionary cause that caused humans to be the way we are, but it doesn't actually make a lot of sense. Most of the uh, stories like that didn't hold water. But there have been these really good analyses that say humans evolved at a time when variability of the climate went up. It wasn't that it made a particular environment, some particular niche, and then humans exploited that one niche. That's how a lot of evolution works. But it was an increase in volatility, this increase in change. And that meant that the adaptable ape was suddenly the effective creature on Earth, right? Our, our bigger brains, all the debt we take on to, to, to fuel the big brains, right? All of that, that's really a response to a volatile, changing world. And that's what we're seeing, right? So, so for, for, for our networks now in, in cybersecurity. So, so I, I think that as a hypothesis about where humans come from is actually a very optimistic uh, signal, just along the lines you're thinking about, about why this one particular lesson, this one salient moment, I think is driving a lot of the right change, and it is going to push us towards a more adaptable, more resilient cyber infrastructure, as opposed to the old, rigid, fragile, castle on a hill stuff we used to use. Very interesting. So we can evolve, uh, and we're probably in a time where we'll see some of this evolution come out. Mike, we, we thank better you. evolve. How about that? Yeah. yeah, exactly. Mike, thank you so much for joining us on Business Security Weekly. Pleasure to be here. Always good to talk to you guys. If anybody wants to learn more about Red Seal or the evolution of cybersecurity, please visit securityweekly.com forward slash Red Seal. We'll take a quick break and then cover the leadership and communications articles for this week.